there is nothing that is inherently good and there's nothing that's inherently bad. Those are words and behaviors that we've been given to try to understand the things that we do, the things that happen to us, and the things that we experience in life. Successful people learn how to make their mind work for them. I'm David Nagel, and this is the Successful Mind Podcast. Hey, everybody. Back in the studio here, um, addressing questions from the fans out there. And I get a question a lot. Uh, Steph gets a question a lot around the idea, is my subconscious all bad? And it's coming from this tremendous conflict uh, that seems to arise out of our subconscious. And I wanted to address it in a way where Hopefully I can give you a little bit of a tool to both understand what's actually happening when you seem to be getting uh, a, a, some kind of duality with what's coming out of your subconscious mind, like polar opposites around the same idea. One part of you says, let's do this. Another part of you says, I'm afraid, or I can, or I won't, or I shouldn't, or um, you know, I feel guilty about it, or I have shame around it, whatever it might be. And how, that, how that's kind of created... And what do we do to begin to take back control and use our subconscious mind actually as uh, kind of integrating it into our decision making and our behavior so that we come out on the side of winning and it actually becomes easier. So it's not a battle because it is one of the battles that I see a lot with people that are that are working really hard at uh trying to achieve some kind of success in, in any area of their life where the, their mind is, is getting the better of them and um, it, either them causing them to stop or self-sabotage or go backwards um, or get depressed or start to move into the, the mind of, you know, is this worth it? I can't do it. I mean, your sub, we, the first thing is this. Don't, we have to understand this right off the bat. Your subconscious mind is insidious as hell, and it's it's functioning perfectly with every person, even if it's stopping you. you ha- we have to understand that the subconscious mind has basically two motives. One is to keep you alive. But when I say that, I mean keep you alive in the moment, not keep you alive like 10 years from now. It doesn't doesn't have the ability to think. It doesn't have the ability to reason. It doesn't understand time. It doesn't understand life and death uh, as we experience it with other people. It's very, it works very much kind of like on absolutes. And the second thing that it's concerned with is procreation, consistently moving uh, the human species forward. So in in that sense, it it is fight or flight. In other words, is my is my life in danger, fight or flight, and keep me alive long enough to procreate to keep that gene pool moving. So, so let's think about this for a second. With the fight or flight part of our of our subconscious mind, it it doesn't know for sure what is a life threatening situation and what isn't. And this is one of the things that's fascinating about this because even things like rejection from someone um, or having an idea turned down or you go for a business loan or funding and you get nixed. They're like, you're out. You, 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 we can't give it to you. Um, sales call rejection, rejection from somebody you're attracted to, whatever, whatever kind of rejection. The, we, f- we have patterns that are in our subconscious mind that are linked up to very specific emotions based on things that we were taught and experiences that we've had that give us an automatic emotional response to that. So if a person gets rejected, uh, based on however their experience was in life around rejection up to that point, they could have anywhere from a small experience like, eh, it didn't feel feel good, but I'm okay, 
Two, I'm totally devastated by it, and I can't pick up the phone again and make another sales call. And I literally spend weeks procrastinating because uh, the, 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 the feeling of that rejection is just so painful, I, I can't stand it. Your subconscious mind only knows that it feels painful. It can't rational, rationalize around that idea. So that's where we have to engage our conscious mind to begin thinking about, okay, what are the logical reasons that I'm actually going to move forward with something that doesn't feel good? That what, what doesn't feel good is coming from programming in your subconscious mind. Okay, so let's put a marker there. The next thing to understand is that we also have what I call spiritual DNA. And our spiritual DNA is uh, what we're born with that is in us that is that needs to be uncovered, opened, worked on, loved, uh, explored, that leads us into our life purpose. It's the reason why we're here. It's what we're supposed to do. It's where our, our gifts and talents lie to a very large degree. And some of that is passed down genetically. Some of it is incorporated spiritually in, into our life or energetically. Again, I have no bent on that, whatever you want to believe around it. But, but you have to understand that it's there. And the proof that it's there, like the best way to me for you to offer proof that it's there is that there's nothing on the planet that's living that doesn't have a purpose and have a very specific purpose. And we can look at different animals or plant life or whatever it is we're looking at, and we can say, oh, by studying this, and, and here's what it does, here's how it contributes, here's its behavior patterns, here's the results that it gets, here's what this thing's purpose is. But with human beings, it's a little bit more vague because we have a physical purpose, and the physical purpose is for the body to grow into the most healthy, most magnificent body that your body can be. And then it has your energetic or spiritual purpose, which is to then bring about what is it that we're going to contribute in our life. Because we have an intellect, and the intellect is what allows us to differentiate between the animal and mankind. Um, the animal has a purpose, and it fulfills that purpose. It doesn't doubt that purpose. It doesn't question that purpose. Mankind, however, has, that, has a purpose, to do something with its intellect, to bring something forth that would give us great satisfaction, great fulfillment in our life, and also benefit the lives of others. It's all that we also see that in the animal kingdom. Everything that an animal does or a plant does, it, it does it for itself, but it also does it for some other life also. It benefits some other life. Now, having said that, the, the problem that we run into is that unless you had very aware parents around this idea, they didn't raise you with the idea of let's do everything that we possibly can to help little Johnny or little Mary figure out what their specific unique life purpose is, what they're really great at, what they love, and then give them all of the values that they need to incorporate in their life and the discipline to be able to carry that out and be productive with that throughout their lifetime. Most people are raised with the idea of what are the survival skills that I need to learn that will allow me to survive, take care of myself, take care of my family, procreate, create more family, and then remain relatively safe through the rest of our life. And we spend a lot of time uh, teaching very basic educational skill sets to people, um, and then we also have uh, the skill sets that allow us to be able to go through, do, complete, be competent at daily functions as, as they show up in our life. And it varies. It varies from person to person, community to community, country to country, um, you know, and things that affect it, right? There's things that affect it. You have race, you have uh, religion, you have sex, um, we have uh, financial income. Uh, environment plays an enormous role in how that part of our subconscious mind is shaped. But however it's shaped, know this. It cannot do anything but express whatever it is that it was, that it was shaped into, into your external world, unless you consciously decide to change it. And this is where the problem 
begins. Because when a person consciously decides to change something, one of two very interesting things is happening. They're either experiencing a desire from within to be, do, or have something better in their life, more in their life. And like we could go down a whole trail with, with that alone, but it is, it is coming from, that would be coming from the spiritual DNA side of ourselves. Very often, we don't know what it is. We just know that there's something in our life that is not fitting the pattern or the image of what we either see or we feel inside of us. So we're like, okay, the way my life is happening right now, the way that I'm experiencing my life is not manage, is not matching this internal feeling that I have that I should be doing something different or I should be doing something uh, bigger in my life or I should be helping more people. Um, and then we have to figure out what that is. So it's either that or what we're... What we're, what's happening is that we're experiencing dissatisfaction and, and usually to some degree e extreme with the life that we're experiencing and we know something's wrong with it. Um, and the, ways that, the way that people communicate this to me very frequently is that they know that the people that they're around are not, are not the right people for them to be around, but they don't know who they should be around. The work that they're doing, they know that it's not right, but they don't know what they should be doing. Um, maybe the way that they're treating themselves, their body, their family, they know that something about it is not right, but they don't know what they should be doing. So that is is kind of kind of comes up for us because we can identify dissatisfaction with things a lot easier in most cases than we can identify the true desires of our heart that say, yes, this is what I want. I've got a very clear picture and do that. The reason for this is the conflict. The conflict in our subconscious mind between our heart's desire and the programming that we received prior to the age of seven and then was, um, it, was it was manifested in our life as uh, results, our environment, um, uh, the life that you're actually living in, and those two things conflict. So when we start to say, I need to make a change, the question is, well, what are we going to change it to? What, what is it that you actually want? So a person goes through a process. They start exploring different things. They may be searching for information on the Internet. They might start picking up books and, and reading not really knowing yet what they're searching for, but it's kind of one of those situations where you know it when you see it, you you can feel it when you run into it, and you know because it's a, it's like a line of demarcation in the sand. It's like oh, this is the thing I'm supposed to be doing. This is something I'm interested in. It's like a light turns on inside of the human being, and for a brief moment, they can see that yes, this feeling that they have. Is out, there is something out there for them. They should be moving in this direction. Now, the second they start to move in that direction, it, it fires up a, like a warning signal in our subconscious mind because our subconscious mind says, whoa, whoa, hold on. We don't know what that is. We don't know if that's safe. That could be dangerous. This comes from our reptilian side of our brain, by the way. It's like, don't go in those woods. There might be a tiger there. There might be a bear there. There might be snakes in there. Um, you know, for, for millions of years, this part of our brain has evolved, 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 but it still operates on the basis of the unknown equals danger. That's it. The unknown equals danger. So we have to learn to use our conscious mind to override that reptilian fear that we have about the unknown. Another thing that's fascinating about this is that all of the fears that I just mentioned about the unknown, about, about this danger, we weren't born with that. But I think that we're primed for it in a way, meaning that basically science and psychology have proven that, that children, babies, are born with two fears, and they're only born with two fears. The fear of falling or being dropped 
and the fear of loud noises, which is kind of like a startle response. All other fears that begin to manifest either in a child or in an adult's life are learned. So this fear of the unknown with just about every person I've ever worked with, I mean, I can't think of anybody that, that where this isn't true in people that I've worked with, um, you can trace it back to how they were raised about the unknown and what was safe and what wasn't safe. I do think that some people are a little bit more uh, kind of, they have a, they're, there's a little bit more genetic ability to take risk in their lives because we have people that are that are very much risk takers. There was, um, uh, and I might have to ask Brandon for a little bit of assistance on this because I'm drawing a blank on the name of the movie. T, do you remember the the name of the movie with the guy that was was free solo, free solo, the guy that was that wanted to climb uh, El Capitan without without ropes? With, yeah, free solo, right? So. In that, in that, it, I recommend everybody watch that that thing. It'll it'll raise the hair on the back of your neck to see what this guy does, um, uh, free soloing. And there's an interesting statement in there, and somebody makes the statement that all free soloers die. It's just a matter of when. It's not a matter of if they fall. They're all going to make a mistake and fall at some point and die. And that's been a hundred percent accurate. Like. There's nobody who's 98 who was a free soloer all of their life. These people generally die, you know, it just, it, in in a in a very short matter of time within the the career of of what they do. So they were examining the brain of uh, of free soloers, and what they found out was that the the fear. Now this goes back to the fear that we're born with, the fear of falling. This fear doesn't exist in their brain. It, if, if they hook up monitors to their brain, it does not light up when they think about falling, when they're uh, 2,000 feet up on a sheer rock face with no ropes, uh, nothing, to, nothing to save them if they make a slip of the hand or a slip of the foot. There's nothing there to save them. They're going down, right? That's it. That there's, they're, they're, they're dead. It's over. Um, that this part of their brain doesn't light up. So... Now, what does that mean? I don't know. I can't tell you. I can't tell you what it means because I think we're still just doing research on this. We could say, well, is that a defect of a person's brain? Is that a genetic predisposition for them? What is it that that's actually causing this? But I. But but here's what I know about people that are successful, is that they have a little bit less of this idea of what scares them, and they're willing to take a little bit more risk in their life. And even saying that, I can tell you a couple of things that I do know for sure, is that I see it in different levels of intensity, which means that some individuals um, are a little bit more uh, kind of preordained not to have as much of it. And then there's individuals where the thing that they want, the desire that they have is stronger than the fear. And I think that's probably more the norm for people that become really successful. Because I've never talked to anybody that that went through the journey of their life to be a success in anything that did not tell me that they battled that they did not battle fear along the way at some point. That they did not battle voices in their head at some point. All I ever hear is different degrees of it, how much of it there was, how much of it there wasn't. Um, some people said they never had any doubt that there was success, but there were things that they were, that they were afraid of or they felt insecure about along the way, and they had to overcome those things. In any case, the question is, well, why would somebody do that? How do we overthrow that part of our, our mind? And the idea is that we're, we consciously determine that we're going to feed the part of our subconscious mind with the direction that we want to go, the reason that we're doing it, the why, the why that we're doing it, and, and what is the win? What is the, what is the purpose of whatever it is that I'm doing? And allow ourselves to feel the excitement, the enthusiasm, um, uh, what, the, what the end result would be like, the joy, the gratitude, 
really start to train ourselves to feel those things about the direction that we're going so that it's constantly in a stage where it's a little bit stronger and it allows us to overthrow those negative voices. Because if there's one thing about this that is like 100% true is whatever your journey is going to be, it's not perfect. It's not a straight line. You're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have failures because failure is how we learn by making mistakes. There's a big difference between failure and shame around failure. There's a big difference between mistakes and shame around mistakes. There's like human beings do some really stupid shit uh, on a regular basis. And how we store that in our memory, if we store it as, ah, hell, that was a mistake. I wish I hadn't done that. Um, However, here's what I learned from it. And I'm better because I, I learned this. That is a very productive way at looking at it. A non-productive way would be looking at it and then wrapping all kinds of shame around it and feeling completely guilty um, and then tearing yourself apart for years or the rest of your life and then never attempting again because shame is what, what took over your mind. We're not born with shame. It doesn't exist when, when we're born. So again, that has to be something that we're, we learn. So we have, we have things like fear, shame, guilt, worry, doubt, rationalizations, um, right and wrong even to an, an enormous degree. Uh, all of that is taught to us and it becomes a pattern in our mind that is in constant conflict with the desire of our heart to be what it is that we want unless we change it. So understand this, they, there's nothing wrong with your mind. Everybody goes through this. One of the best things a person can do is to begin to go through a process to resolve the conflicts. Now, I get questions all the time about how do I make a quantum leap? How do I do this faster? How do I get there? Legitimate questions. I understand. I understand a person that, you know, they may not want to be in a situation they're in. They want to jump, they want to jump ahead faster. Uh, I talk to that with a lot of people because given the right mindset, the right circumstances, the right plan, anybody can make a quantum leap. Um, but their whole life is not going to be a series of, of quantum leaps. So what we have to do to clear up this conflict is we have to study. There's no way around this. You have a rationalization around everything that you believe. It doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it wrong. It just means that you have some understanding about what you believe and why you believe it and what you do with it and how that's carried out in your life. If you receive no other intellectual information around the idea, it's almost like we become paralyzed to whatever the limitations of that idea is, good or bad. What is very true about this is the idea of good and bad itself doesn't really exist. There is nothing that is inherently good, and there's nothing that's inherently bad. Those are words and behaviors that we've been given to try to understand the things that we do, the things that happen to us, and the things that we experience in life. So when I say that there's no good and bad, very often when when I'm having a conversation with somebody who's never heard this before, it kind of their brain kind of goes, er, like what well, what am I supposed to do with that? There's there's no good and bad. What directs my life? What guides me from that? The idea of examining that question uh, about good and bad or or the idea around it is to really understand this: that human beings give everything the meaning that we say that it has. Nothing in and of itself has any meaning whatsoever other than what we understand about it or think we understand about it and then the meaning that we attach to it. So we have all of that running around in our mind. If we've given things that will move us forward in life, that will allow us to achieve our goals, if we've given those things negative meanings, then we're going to have a tremendous conflict as we're trying to move forward. So if we if we take a if we take if we pull, like pull the camera lens back and we do what i call a god's eye view 
of life itself. What we're looking at is all of these different things in life that we've given meaning to. Well, how do we rearrange our value system and our ethics so that it works and yet that we, 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 we do this in a way where we're doing no harm to ourselves, we're doing no harm to others? It's basically to understand this principle, that all of life works under the intention of more life. That we know. Life is always seeking to move forward uh, um, in and of itself. So, so that's true in nature. That's true in human beings. What that can't do is choose uh, in and of itself how it's going to express that. What it does is it is an energy, it is an intention that flows to and through people. It flows to and through nature. It's always moving things toward more life. But it's like water. It becomes the vessel that it flows through. So water takes the shape of whatever vessel it contains it. This life energy that flows through human beings is flowing through a couple of different things. It's flowing through our genetic DNA, which the DNA is the code that tells it what to become. So you have energy that the D, it flows through your DNA and it says that energy becomes a fingernail. And th this energy, when it flows through this part of the DNA, said that becomes a hair follicle. And this becomes an arm and that becomes an eyeball. We also have the, the, the DNA, if you will, the spiritual DNA, which is the purpose or the intention for what we're, what we're here. And as it flows through that, then it wants to become that but it's running up against the conflict of our subconscious mind with all the other beliefs and patterns in our life. So as we understand more about life itself and what our purpose is, we can go in and change that pattern in which the energy is flowing through and allow it to, to manifest itself much different than the life that we're experiencing. So if you're looking at your life and you're going, oh, this sucks, I don't want to live this way, whatever that is for you, then it's about understanding what do I change those beliefs and patterns to that the same energy that's flowing through that is flowing through anybody else who is successful. And then if you adopt those patterns and those behaviors, you too will have the success that you want. There's nothing that... Um, I, th I, th I thought this idea was very liberating when I first heard it many years ago. There's nothing that anybody else has done in the world that you too cannot do if you really want to. And I think what's important to know about that is that you, I say that is a very broad general statement, but there is some specificity to it when you think about this. You're not going to want to do everything. There are a lot of things that people have done that you have no desire to do at all. Like I tell people all the time, I'm very clear on what my purpose is. My mind doesn't wake up one morning and go, huh, I wonder if maybe we change direction and you become a brain surgeon. Like I never think of that. And there's a, there's a billion things I probably never think of because that's not my spiritual DNA. That is not the purpose that I'm here for. But what my mind does do and what I've also prepared it to do is to constantly be on the lookout of how do I keep changing and how do I assist other people uh, in changing and mapping their life out and making it the way that they want to be. And with this total understanding that, that even I myself have this value conflict in my mind that needs to be worked on every day, it, it, every day. But instead of reacting to it, I think the, the best advice that I can give is instead of reacting to it, the idea is to investigate it. Don't just shut it down because you feel scared or you feel rejected or you feel worried or you're like, oh, this is a big chance. This is a big risk. Understand the process that's actually taking place in your mind that is trying to stop you and then do something to create new patterns that will allow you to do it easily and effortlessly. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like double down on this comment because it's very important. It's one of the things that I see people miss all the time when somebody talks about this. The ease and the effortless part of it comes when you've integrated the new ideas into your behavior and the way that you think so that you don't have to, to consciously make yourself think 
about something positive or something different. It becomes the way that you think. And that was when I, if you've listened to earlier podcasts, I've talked many times about once I started to wake up to my own potential, I went through a process of seven years of intense study. And, when, and I've, I've never stopped, but the, the initial seven years was what it took for me to reverse all of the thinking that had been programmed in my mind and to do the educational work where I would learn what all of these different things were and what they meant and then examine my life and reassign new meanings to things that were important to me where previously I had negative meanings behind it or dysfunctional meanings, the meanings, and they would hold me back. So it is that part is a process that nobody gets around, okay? Um, and everybody's different. So you may think to yourself, well, does everybody have to go through this? No. The, the answer to that is no. If you were raised in a conscious family and you were exposed to the idea that I'm talking to you about today where you you take things in life that have value conflicts around it and sometimes it's just it's great things about us and about life and somebody throughout history has made those things wrong so uh really quick ones that everybody will real recognize is money like there's there's such a duality around money um in our world it, it's unbelievable at one moment one minute it's good the next minute it's bad uh if you have too much of it it'll make you a bad person like all kinds of crazy shit we believe around money sex is another big one sex is an urge it is the greatest energy in our body it is a creative energy both physically intellectually and spiritually and when it's not bottled up and it's understood and you really understand your own sexual values what that allows you to do is it allows you to harness that energy and to to create in a magnificent way. And it also allows you to enjoy your sex life in an, in an amazing way. But there's a lot of people um, that don't because they have a lot of negative views around sex in their mind. And if you have those views in your mind that are negative around sex, it affects your body when you're trying to have sex. So that's where we end up with different kinds of sexual dysfunction. It's the same thing with money. People say to me all the time, show me how to be a millionaire. And it's like, okay, that's great. We can show you how to be a millionaire. But if you don't resolve the conflicts that you have around money and everything that goes along with that, your, your, your body is not going to do the work. Your mind is not going to think the thoughts in order to be able to create the opportunities for that new environment. And I see it all the time. I'll do a seminar and I will offer um, a program or another seminar or something that will, that will allow a person to actually make these changes. And then when they hear the price tag of it, they're like, oh no, I don't wanna do that. And, and, it, and you can see it in their face. It's like, do they really want what they say that they want? Because it's a lot of work to make these changes. It's a lot of learning. It's a lot of studying. And it's a lot of applying it in your life so that you can become proficient at it. It is the best investment you could ever make in your life is to find somebody to help you make these changes. And here's why. Because it gives you complete freedom. As long as you're thinking thoughts that other people have given you for multiple generations and you're stuck in your own life, and you're not earning the amount of money that you want to earn whenever it is that you want to earn it. You're not able to express yourself in the ways that you think about in your, your secret thoughts, whether it's verbally or physically or sexually or in the expression of your own unique genius, then it, you're living in a prison, and it's, and it's in your own mind. So what is it that you think is going to change that? There's nothing that, it, it's not going to just happen. It's not like taking a pill or reading a book and it's all changed. You're talking about changing generations of patterns in the way that you think and in your behaviors. So this is where all this conflict lies in a person's mind. 
And the idea is that we remove the conflict. And when we remove the conflict, we remove the confusion. And when we remove the confusion and we create new patterns, you start to think new thoughts that are productive that will allow you to bring in whatever level of success that you want. That's not an if. That's not a maybe. That's an absolute. It is an absolute because here's what I know about you. Even if I don't know you personally, I know you have a purpose, period. You have an amazing purpose, and you have a right to be happy. You have a right to be fulfilled. You have a right to express yourself. You have a right to earn as much money as you desire to live the life that you want to live for yourself and for others. You deserve love. You deserve to share that love. Um, there's no end to the amazing things that you deserve. And it, it, is it selfish? You're damn right it's selfish. But you're supposed to be selfish. Not self-centered, but selfish. And even there's an argument for self-centered when you look at it from, I need to have my own self-center in the right place so that I can be a benefit to anybody else in my life. Most people don't focus on themselves enough, and they're not bringing all of themselves or the best of themselves to the table when they're interacting with anybody, whether it's their spouse or their lover or their children or their employer or their employees or how they show up in the, in the world in a, in a charitable or philanthropic way because they're in so much need. They don't have enough money. They don't have enough love. They're not getting enough attention. They're not getting their needs met. Why? Because they're not being selfish enough to straighten out their own thinking so that they can show up 100%. And, and this is one of the places where like, here's where a huge block would come in. This would be like a huge value conflict. We're taught that it's not okay to be selfish. So when we start to think about doing something, we're not even thinking, like it's not a conscious thought at the moment. Oh, uh, I, I don't know if I wanna do that because it would be selfish. It's an underlying program that just makes you feel bad. So, but selfishness would actually be the problem. You think you're being selfish by spending this money or, or doing this thing or, or exploring the dream that you have in life. And then we just stop. We just stop. We, and we don't even know. We haven't uncovered what the belief is that caused it. And there's a ton of beliefs in there that could cause it. Selfishness is just one of them. But it's not like your mind kicks up the belief and goes, bing, 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 you're being a selfish ass by doing this, right? No, it's probably not doing that. It's just making you feel bad, but you don't understand what the bad feeling is because you have felt it so many times, you only need a twinge of that bad feeling and then it pulls you away from what you wanna do. So again, there's the, there's the conflict. So just to, to kind of bring this in for a landing so that it makes sense to everybody, the idea is that we learn to follow our heart's desire over everything. That takes time, it takes study, it takes wanting to do that, it takes you wanting to have something different in your life. Then you need to go in and work through the conflicts. You need to reassign meaning, intention, purpose, your why to all of the different areas of your life so that you can take back control of your own thinking and live the life that you want. That's it for today, T. Thanks for listening to the Successful Mind Podcast. And if you like what you heard and you want to know more, go to davidnagel.com forward slash free stuff.